Hello and welcome back to Genomic Variant Analysis and Clinical Interpretation course. In this session, we will be discussing some of the ACMG AMP attributes with a focus on autosomal dominant disorders. To begin with, let us revise the basic difference between autosomal recessive and autosomal dominant inheritance. In the case of autosomal recessive inheritance, let's say, for example, uh, if the parents are carriers for a disease or a trait that is carrying one normal allele and one alternate allele, then there can be three scenarios possible for the child. The child can be unaffected, the child can be carrier just like the parents or the child can be affected. So, for the child to be affected, both of the alleles should be of the alternate type. Whereas, in case of dominant disorders, let's say if the mother is carrying the variant allele and is affected, then there can be two possible scenarios for the child. Either the child can be unaffected or the child can be affected. In this case, only one alternate allele is enough to make the child affected. So, this is the basic pattern of inheritance, but most of the times the situation is little tricky in case of autosomal dominant disorders. This is due to the reduced penetrance that mostly occurs in autosomal dominant disorders. To understand reduced penetrance, let us first understand penetrance. So, penetrance is defined as the percentage of individuals with a given allele who exhibit the phenotype associated with that allele. So, for example, there are 100 people carrying the variant allele for an autosomal dominant disorder, but only 40 of them are expressing the phenotype. In this case, we will say that the penetrance is 40% or reduced or incomplete. Now, there are a number of factors which result in reduced penetrance, such as mutation type, gene expression level, environment, etc. To understand this concept in detail, let us see few examples of causes of incomplete penetrance. First example is mutation type in case of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome type 4. Now this syndrome is caused by mutation in col 3 a one gene that makes collagen 3 protein. If the mutation is missense or splicing mutation, then there will be a faulty gene product that is formed that disrupts the entire triple helical structure of the collagen molecule. Whereas, if there is a null mutation, then unlike the previous case, the amount of normal uh, collagen that will be formed will be reduced. So, therefore, the penetrance of the disease is high in case of missense and splicing variations. The second example is copy number variation in case of spinal muscular atrophy. SMA is caused due to mutations in SMN1 gene that produce SMN protein that is the spinal motor neuron protein. In normal scenario, there are two genes that make SMN protein, SMN1 and SMN2. However, most of the SMN protein is formed from the SMN1 gene and only a small amount that is about 10% is formed from SMN2 gene. Now, the copy number of SMN2 gene can vary uh, between 2 to 8 uh, copies in different individuals. So, this is the case in the normal scenario. Now, let's see what happens in the disease case. In disease case, there is a homozygous deletion or mutation in SMN1 gene. Uh, then, the increased copy number of SMN2 gene can greatly reduce the severity of the disease. This is because the higher copy numbers of SMN2 gene can actually functionally compensate for the loss of SMN1 gene. So therefore, if the copy number of SMN2 gene is low, the penetrance will be high and if the copy number of SMN2 gene is high, then penetrance will be low. The third example of cause of reduced penetrance is age and gender. Long QT syndrome is caused by the mutations in KCNQ1 gene, but the penetrance is usually low. Uh, during childhood, the risk of cardiac events have been found to be significantly higher in LQT1 males than in females. Uh, on the other hand, in adults who remain symptom uh, adults who remain symptom free till uh, age of 16 years, the females have significantly higher risk of cardiac events as compared to males carrying the same genotype. Now, having understood the concept of reduced penetrance, especially in case of autosomal dominant disorders and the causes behind it, let us revisit few of the ACMG AMP attributes. The first attribute is BS2. It is a strong evidence for the benign interpretation uh, of the variant and is given when a variant is observed in a healthy adult individual. 
However, it is to be given only when the disease is fully penitent at an early age and then the variant is observed in the healthy adult individual. For example, out of these two conditions, one can consider giving the BS2 for the condition shown as A since the penitence is 100% in this case. Next is PM3 and BP2 which are given for cis and trans conditions. In case of autosomal recessive disorders, if one variation already known to be pathogenic is present, then the other variation of interest is present in cis means that the other chromosome is completely fine and thus it doesn't really add much evidence for the autosomal recessive disorder. Because remember, both of the alleles have to be of the variant type to express an autosomal uh, recessive trait. In this case, we will assign BP2 for the variant which is supporting evidence of benign impact. Whereas, if the variation of interest is in, uh, is in trans with respect to the known pathogenic variation, then both of the alleles might be affected and thus one can assign PM3 which is a mod moderate evidence for pathogenicity. In case of autosomal dominant disorders, only one variant allele is enough to show the phenotype. Therefore, whether the variation of interest is in cis or trans, it would not be a, a considered so much important for pathogenicity and therefore we will assign BP2 which is a supporting evidence of benign impact. However, there is one caution to be remembered here. Uh, BP2 can only be assigned when the disease is fully penetrant, meaning we are sure that the disease is 100% explained by the known uh, pathogenic variation and there is no other underlying cause explaining reduced penetrance. If the disease is not fully penetrant, then we, ca we cannot assign BP2 for the variation of interest because uh, this variation may have some other role in disease manifestation. Next attribute is PP5. It is similar to the previous attribute in the sense that it is a supporting evidence of a benign impact to a variant when a pathogenic variant at a different locus is present that is explaining the disease. So, if a disease is already explained by a pathogenic variant at a different gene, then we will assign BP5 to our variant of interest. But one has to be cautious in cases of autosomal recessive disorders where more than one pathogenic variant uh, is possible and disorders where multiple variants can contribute to more severe disease or diseases where multigenic inheritance is known to occur such as parded beetle syndrome, in which case the additional variant in the second locus may also be pathogenic. Next are the attributes based on segregation data. In this case, I have taken the example of a variant that was given to you as an exercise. It is a PKP2 variant. Now, literature evidences for segregation studies gives us the PMID in which a family reported with ARVC is carrying a variant variation of interest. Now, in this pedigree, three family members have the disease and carry the variation, whereas one family member has the disease but does not carry the variation. Now, on seeing this, one would observe the lack of segregation and jump on to assign BS4 attribute. But the other literature at the other literature evidences tell different stories there are different evidences for the same variation and are contradictory since bs4 is a strong attribute for benign interpretation it it could change the final uh, acmg amp impact therefore when the evidences are con uh, contradictory one should ideally does not assign it Next attributes are about de novo variations. Now we know that de novo variations occur due to three mechanisms. First, when one of the parental gametes carry the mutation, in this uh, case the sperm. Uh, second case, in which the mutation occurs just after the fertilization and was not present in the parents before. And third case, in which the mutation occurs during development. Now based on this, in case 1, the child is carrying a de novo variation and we assume that the parents are true biological parents of the patient with the disease and no family history. So, in this case, we will give PM6 which is a moderate evidence for pathogenicity. Whereas, in case 2, again there is a de novo variation that is present in the patient and, ab uh, and absent in the parents. But it is confirmed that the parents are true biological parents of the patient with disease and no family history. In this case, we will give PS2 which is a strong evidence for pathogenicity. 
Now, based on our discussion, the take-home message is that for autosomal dominant disorders, one should pay more attention to the following attributes. That is, first is BS2, in which the penitence has to be checked if it is complete and then one has to check if the variation is present in a healthy adult individual. Second is PM3 and BP2, where the mode of inheritance has to be checked properly and then one should check whether it is in cis and trans. Third, BP5, where one should consider uh, the clear-cut cases of single-gene autosomal dominant conditions and then only assign BP5. Uh, next is PP1 and BS4, where one should check all the available evidences in literature and then consider whether to assign anything or not. The last, uh, the last is PM6 and PS2, where one should consider de novo variation when the variation is in a gene that strongly explains the phenotype. This is a, a primary condition. So, I hope this session will clarify all your doubts regarding the discussed attributes in autosomal dominant disorders. Thank you all for paying the attention.